anarchism what it really stands for part one from anarchism and other essays by emma goldman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine anarchism what it really stands for part one anarchy ever reviled a curse ne'er understood thou art the grisly terror of our age wreck of all order cried the multitude art thou in war and murder's endless rage o oh, let them cry to them that ne'er have striven the truth that lies behind a word to find to them the word's right meaning was not given they shall continue blind among the blind but thou o oh word so clear so strong so pure thou sayest all which i for goal have taken i give thee to the future thine secure when each at least unto himself shall waken comes it in sunshine in the tempest thrill i cannot tell but it the earth shall see i am an anarchist wherefore i will not rule and also ruled i will not be john henry mckay the history of human growth and development is at the same time the history of the terrible struggle of every new idea heralding the approach of a brighter dawn in its tenacious hold on tradition the old has never hesitated to make use of the foulest and cruelest means to stay the advent of the new in whatever form or period the latter may have asserted itself nor need we retrace our steps into the distant past to realize the enormity of opposition difficulties and hardships placed in the path of every progressive idea the rack the thumbscrew and the knout are still with us so are the convict's garb and the social wrath all conspiring against the spirit that is serenely marching on anarchism could not hope to escape the fate of all other ideas of innovation indeed as the most revolutionary and uncompromising innovator anarchism must needs meet with the combined ignorance and venom of the world it aims to reconstruct to deal even remotely with all that is being said and done against anarchism would necessitate the writing of a whole volume i shall therefore meet only two of the principal objections in so doing i shall attempt to elucidate what anarchism really stands for the strange phenomenon of the opposition to anarchism is that it brings to light the relation between so-called intelligence and ignorance and yet this is not so very strange when we consider the relativity of all things the ignorant mass has in its favour that it makes no pretence of knowledge or tolerance acting as it always does by mere impulse its reasons are like those of a child why because yet the opposition of the uneducated to anarchism deserves the same consideration as that of the intelligent man what then are the objections first anarchism is impractical though a beautiful ideal second anarchism stands for violence and destruction hence it must be repudiated as vile and dangerous both the intelligent man and the ignorant mass judge not from a thorough knowledge of the subject but either from hearsay or false interpretation a practical scheme says oscar wilde is either one already in existence or a scheme that could be carried out under the existing conditions but it is exactly the existing conditions that one objects to and any scheme that could accept these conditions is wrong and foolish the true criterion of the practical therefore is not whether the latter can keep intact the wrong or foolish rather is it whether the scheme has vitality enough to leave the stagnant waters of the old and build as well as sustain new life in the light of this conception anarchism is indeed practical more than any other idea it is helping to do away with the wrong and foolish more than any other idea it is building and sustaining new life the emotions of the ignorant man are continuously kept at a pitch by the most blood-curdling stories about anarchism not a thing too outrageous to be employed against this philosophy and its exponents therefore anarchism represents to the unthinking what the proverbial bad man does to the child a black monster bent on swallowing everything in short destruction and violence destruction and violence how is the ordinary man to know that the most violent element in society is ignorance 
that its power of destruction is the very thing anarchism is combating nor is he aware that anarchism whose roots as it were are part of nature's forces destroys not healthful tissue but parasitic growths that feed on the life's essence of society it is merely clearing the soil from weeds and sagebrush that it may eventually bear healthy fruit someone has said that it requires less mental effort to condemn than to think the widespread mental indolence so prevalent in society proves this to be only too true rather than to go to the bottom of any given idea to examine into its origin and meaning most people will either condemn it altogether or rely on some superficial or prejudicial definition of non-essentials anarchism urges man to think to investigate to analyze every proposition but that the brain capacity of the average reader be not taxed too much i also shall begin with a definition and then elaborate on the latter anarchism the philosophy of a new social order based on liberty unrestricted by man-made law the theory that all forms of government rest on violence and are therefore wrong and harmful as well as unnecessary the new social order rests of course on the materialistic basis of life but while all anarchists agree that the main evil to-day is an economic one they maintain that the solution of that evil can be brought about only through the consideration of every phase of life individual as well as the collective the internal as well as the external phases a thorough perusal of the history of human development will disclose two elements in bitter conflict with each other elements that are only now beginning to be understood not as foreign to each other but as closely related and truly harmonious if only placed in proper environment the individual and social instincts the individual and society have waged a relentless and bloody battle for ages each striving for supremacy because each was blind to the value and importance of the other the individual and social instincts the one a most potent factor for individual endeavour for growth aspiration self-realization the other an equally potent factor for mutual helpfulness and social well-being the explanation of the storm raging within the individual and between him and his surroundings is not far to seek the primitive man unable to understand his being much less the unity of all life felt himself absolutely dependent on blind hidden forces ever ready to mock and taunt him out of that attitude grew the religious concepts of man as a mere speck of dust dependent on superior powers on high who can only be appeased by complete surrender all the early sagas rest on that idea which continues to be the late motif of the biblical tales dealing with the relation of man to god to the state to society again and again the same motif man is nothing the powers are everything thus jehovah would only endure man on condition of complete surrender man can have all the glories of the earth but he must not become conscious of himself the state society and moral laws all sing the same refrain man can have all the glories of the earth but he must not become conscious of himself anarchism is the only philosophy which brings to man the consciousness of himself which maintains that god the state and society are non-existent that their promises are null and void since they can be fulfilled only through man's subordination anarchism is therefore the teacher of the unity of life not merely in nature but in man there is no conflict between the individual and the social instincts any more than there is between the heart and the lungs the one the receptacle of a precious life essence the other the repository of the element that keeps the essence pure and strong the individual is the heart of society conserving the essence of social life society is the lungs which are distributing the element to keep the life essence that is the individual pure and strong the one thing of value in the world says emerson is the active soul this every man contains within him the soul active sees absolute truth and utters truth and creates in other words the individual instinct is the thing of value in the world it is the true soul that sees and creates the truth alive out of which is to come a still greater truth the reborn social soul 
anarchism is the great liberator of man from the phantoms that have held him captive it is the arbiter and pacifier of the two forces for individual and social harmony to accomplish that unity anarchism has declared war on the pernicious influences which have so far prevented the harmonious blending of individual and social instincts the individual and society religion the dominion of the human mind property the dominion of human needs and government the dominion of human conduct represent the stronghold of man's enslavement and all the horrors it entails religion how it dominates man's mind how it humiliates and degrades his soul god is everything man is nothing says religion but out of that nothing god has created a kingdom so despotic so tyrannical so cruel so terribly exacting that naught but gloom and tears and blood have ruled the world since gods began anarchism rouses man to rebellion against this black monster break your mental fetters says anarchism to man for not until you think and judge for yourself will you get rid of the dominion of darkness the greatest obstacle to all progress property the dominion of man's needs the denial of the right to satisfy his needs time was when property claimed a divine right when it came to man with the same refrain even as religion sacrifice abnegate submit the spirit of anarchism has lifted man from his prostrate position he now stands erect with his face toward the light he has learned to see the insatiable devouring devastating nature of property and he is preparing to strike the monster dead property is robbery said the great french anarchist proudhon yes but without risk and danger to the robber monopolizing the accumulated efforts of man property has robbed him of his birthright and has turned him loose a pauper and an outcast property has not even the time-worn excuse that man does not create enough to satisfy all needs the a b c student of economics knows that the productivity of labor within the last few decades far exceeds normal demand a hundredfold but what are normal demands to an abnormal institution the only demand that property recognizes is its own gluttonous appetite for greater wealth because wealth means power the power to subdue to crush to exploit the power to enslave to outrage to degrade america is particularly boastful of her great power her enormous national wealth poor america of what avail is all her wealth if the individuals comprising the nation are wretchedly poor if they live in squalor in filth in crime with hope and joy gone a homeless soilless army of human prey it is generally conceded that unless the returns of any business venture exceed the cost bankruptcy is inevitable but those engaged in the business of producing wealth have not yet learned even this simple lesson every year the cost of production in human life is growing larger fifty thousand killed one hundred thousand wounded in america last year the returns to the masses who help to create wealth are ever getting smaller yet america continues to be blind to the inevitable bankruptcy of our business of production nor is this the only crime of the latter still more fatal is the crime of turning the producer into a mere particle of a machine with less will and decision than his master of steel and iron man is being robbed not merely of the products of his labour but of the power of free initiative of originality and the interest in or desire for the things he is making real wealth consists in things of utility and beauty in things that help to create strong beautiful bodies and surroundings inspiring to live in but if man is doomed to wind cotton around a spool or dig coal or build roads for thirty years of his life there can be no talk of wealth what he gives to the world is only grey and hideous things reflecting a dull and hideous existence too weak to live too cowardly to die strange to say there are people who extol this deadening method of centralized production as the proudest achievement of our age they fail utterly to realize that if we are to continue in machine subserviency our slavery is more complete than was our bondage to the king they do not want to know that centralization is not only the death knell of liberty but also of health and beauty of art and science 
all these being impossible in a clock-like mechanical atmosphere anarchism cannot but repudiate such a method of production its goal is the freest possible expression of all the latent powers of the individual oscar wilde defines a perfect personality as one who develops under perfect conditions who is not wounded maimed or in danger a perfect personality then is only possible in a state of society where man is free to choose the mode of work the conditions of work and the freedom to work one to whom the making of a table the building of a house or the tilling of the soil is what the painting is to the artist and the discovery to the scientist the result of inspiration of intense longing and deep interest in work as a creative force that being the ideal of anarchism its economic arrangements must consist of voluntary productive and distributive associations gradually developing into free communism as the best means of producing with the least waste of human energy anarchism however also recognizes the right of the individual or numbers of individuals to arrange at all times for other forms of work in harmony with their tastes and desires such free display of human energy being possible only under complete individual and social freedom anarchism directs its forces against the third and greatest foe of all social equality namely the state organized authority or statutory law the dominion of human conduct just as religion has fettered the human mind and as property or the monopoly of things has subdued and stifled man's needs so has the state enslaved his spirit dictating every phase of conduct all government in essence says emerson is tyranny it matters not whether it is government by divine right or majority rule in every instance its aim is the absolute subordination of the individual end of anarchism what it really stands for part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine